The last time that we met, we covered the last part of chapter 13. That part has to do with the false prophet. And then I was gone for two weeks. Now, it might have seemed longer to you, and it seemed like a long time for me. And the reason it did is because my wife didn't go with me. And I've had people come up to me, and they've asked, are you going to take a group next year? And the question, or what I respond to them and say is, that's the wrong question. The question you really need to be asking, is Lisa going to be going next year? Because the one thing that I found out is, I'm not going back to Israel without Lisa. So if she goes, I'm going and I'm going to take a group. If she doesn't go, well, then you need to try and talk her into going so that you can go. Does that make sense? Now, during that time that I was in Israel, I saw a lot of great things. This was kind of an unusual tour. It was called an in-depth tour, and really it was for pastors. And the interesting thing is, I was the only pastor on the trip. And so we would leave at 8 o'clock in the morning from our hotel, and we would get in on average 7 or 8 o'clock that night. And what was interesting about that is that I was just so gung-ho on all the things that we were seeing, and all the other people were like, oh my gosh, we're not getting in till 7 o'clock, and they were all upset. And if you've ever been to Israel, you understand that it's not flat. It's nothing but hills and mountains, and you're walking up and you're walking down. And, and this year, May and June, was just as hot as what July and August usually is. And so we had several people who stayed at the hotel for certain days because they were just worn out. But we saw everything. We went from what the Bible refers to as Dan all the way to Beersheba. Now, whenever you go through the Bible and it says from Dan to Beersheba, what it means is all of Israel. Because Dan is at the northernmost point of Israel. And then Beersheba is not the southernmost tip of it, but it's the only large city at the southernmost part. Does that make sense? And so we just kind of went all over. We stayed six days in Jerusalem. We walked through Hezekiah's Tunnel. We went up David's Citadel. When everyone else was eating lunch, I decided that I was going to walk on top of the old western wall. And uh, not western wall, the northern wall of the city. And so while everyone else was eating lunch, I was walking the wall and was going to meet them at the garden tomb. Uh, we did just about everything. We went places that normally people don't go. We went into Jericho, which basically... Uh, most tours won't go into because it's just controlled by Palestinians. We saw the stream in which Elijah turned the bitter water into sweet water. Um, we saw the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, we, we just went everywhere. I went to the city of Nain, and most people won't even take you to the city of Nain. We went to the Herodian. If you don't even know what the Herodian is, hopefully if you go with me, we'll get a chance to go to the Herodian. But it was fantastic. But I'll be honest with you, I was glad to be home. But you know, an interesting thing happened to me while I was at Israel. How many of you have ever heard of the Golan Heights? You know, the Golan Heights is one of those places that there's a lot of bickering over. And the reason why there's a lot of bickering over is because the Golan Heights is this high, rocky plateau that overlooks the Jordan River Valley to the west, and it overlooks Syria to the east. Now, Syria was in control over it until the Six-Day War in 1967. But during the Six-Day War, Israelis actually captured the Golan Heights, and now it's under Israeli control. So we went up to the northernmost point on the Golan Heights to see the road that leads to Damascus. Now, why in the world would we want to see the road that leads to Damascus? What happened there? Paul. That's right, the Apostle Paul conversion. And so we're on top of the Golan Heights, and we're looking at that, and all of a sudden we hear these sirens going off. And we turn and we look down the mountain and here comes all of these UN vehicles. There's about six or seven in a row. And they've got the sirens going and you've got the Israeli army coming up behind them. And my first thought is, great, I'm going to see a UN international crisis here. I'm going to be here when it happens, and I'll be able to come up. But no, it wasn't. Actually, they were bringing defense ministers from some of the Eastern European countries, and they were actually coming in and looking at the UN Strip that separates Israel from Syria. But what's interesting about this is that Syria actually dominated the Golan Heights. They were in control of it until 1967. But during the 1967 war, that six-day war, Israel actually captured it. And so... We were up there, and you get a chance, after you've seen everything, to actually go through the Syrian bunkers. And so I was one of those that wanted to go through the Syrian bunkers that's underground. And so me and a group from our group went through the Syrian bunkers. And as I was going through, I was looking at all this graffiti that the Syrian soldiers had written 
on the walls of the bunker. Now, you need to understand that once they took this, Israel does not have soldiers up there. So all the graffiti that was on the walls of this Syrian bunker was from the Syrian soldiers almost 40-something years ago. And all of the graffiti was written in Arabic, except one. And when I saw this graffiti that was written on the walls in English, it drew my attention. And so I walked over there to see what it said, and this is what it said. We pray for your coming, Al-Mahdi. And then there were signatures in Arabic underneath it. And the reason I knew that they were signatures is not because I can read Arabic. I cannot read Arabic. But you know how you can tell that it's someone's name because everyone writes distinctively. And you would see this little bit of Arabic and then someone else you could tell had written underneath it. And there was just this whole long list. And what basically it was saying is, we are praying for your coming, Al-Mahdi. Now, no one in our group had ever heard of the Al-Mahdi before except me. I knew that Al-Mahdi is actually an Islamic title and it refers to the Messiah that the Muslims are looking for. The Shiites refer to the Al-Mahdi as the 12th Imam. So when I read what a Syrian soldier had written on the wall over 40 years ago, a chill went up my spine. Because I know that the Messiah that the Muslims are looking for will be the Antichrist that John wrote about in the book of Revelation. And Muslims all over the world are praying to Allah for this Messiah to come. And believe me, he's going to come. And Muslims are going to follow him thinking that he's the Messiah, when in reality, he's the Antichrist. Now, if you think about it, most of us would think, there's no way that someone's going to be able to follow this Antichrist. But they are. And so the question that I always have is, why in the world would Muslims follow the Antichrist? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the Islamic prophecies concerning their Messiah, the Ahmadi, are exactly the same as John's prophecies concerning the Antichrist. So when the Antichrist comes on the scene, fulfilling all of the prophecies that John wrote in the book of Revelation and Daniel wrote in the book of Daniel, He'll also be doing everything that the Muslims expect their Messiah to do. Now, to help you understand what I'm talking about, let me show you a, sh a chart comparing Islamic prophecies of their Messiah to John's prophecies and Daniel's prophecies of the Antichrist. Let's go ahead and put that chart up there if we can. If you'll notice on this chart, basically I've got two headings. Oh, this is the laser. I've got the Antichrist on the left, and I've got the Al-Mahdi on the right. Now, underneath the Antichrist are a few of the prophecies concerning the Antichrist, and on the right are a few of the prophecies concerning the Al-Mahdi. I want to show you how similar they are. The very first prophecy concerning the Antichrist that almost every scholar will point to is found in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27. It says, the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. So what this is saying is that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the very first thing that he's going to do, and this is what initiates the seven-year tribulation, is he's going to negotiate or broker a peace treaty with Israel. But here's what's interesting. The Islamic faith teaches that when the Almadi comes, guess what he's going to do? He is also going to establish or negotiate or broker a peace treaty with Israel. Let me read from the Islamic tradition if you don't mind. The prophet said, there will be four peace agreements between you and the Romans. Wait a minute, Romans, you said he's going to make a peace treaty with Israel. Well, let me explain something. This was kind of interesting. I didn't know this until I went over to Israel this time. But we had an Israeli tour guide, and he was fantastic. I'm telling you, he just made the Bible come alive. And I got to talking with him, and we started talking about the Zionists. Now, does everyone know what a Zionist is? A Zionist are those Jews that actually came from Europe and different places to come back and settle in Israel. And he told me something interesting. He said, Arabs do not have a word for the term Zionist. I said, you're kidding. I said, well, what do they call you? What do they call all of these Jews that have come back to Israel to create their own nation? He said, they call them crusaders. I said, 
Why would they call them crusaders? He says, because they see Zionists as crusaders. You need to understand that the crusaders came from Rome and Europe, and the whole purpose when they came was to establish a nation and to drive the Muslims out. And he made an interesting comment, not even knowing about Islamic tradition. He said, usually when they're talking about Israel, many times they're referred to them as Romans. Now notice what Islamic tradition says. The prophet said there will be four peace agreements between you and the Romans. The fourth will be mediated through a person who will be from the progeny of Hadrat Aaron. In other words, it's going to be a descendant of Aaron Jews. And will be upheld for seven years. So all of a sudden, we see probably the most famous of all of the prophecies concerning the Antichrist is he's going to broker a seven-year peace treaty and start the, the uh, tribulation off with this peace treaty with Israel. But we also see that when the Almighty comes, he's going to start his reign by doing what? A seven-year peace treaty. Then let's move to the second one. We also know, because of Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27, that when the Antichrist comes and he negotiates this peace treaty, that he's going to break the treaty in the middle of the seven years. Notice what Daniel 9.27 says. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. Now, that's great. But here's what's interesting. Do you realize that the Muslims' Messiah, they teach and prophesy that he's going to do the very same thing? Let me just go ahead and read it to you. Notice what it says. In the begin this is Islamic tradition. In the beginning, the, Ma the Mahdi will live peaceably with the Jews. But that will all change halfway through. At that time, the Mahdi will seek to kill all the Jews who haven't been converted. The prophet said, the last hour will not come. The last hour referring to the last half. The last hour will not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims will kill them. Not only that, the Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, he's represented by the white horseman of the apocalypse, remember? And the reason he's riding the white horse is because he's ushering in peace when he first comes. But here's what's interesting. The Muslims also believe that when the Almighty comes, he's going to be riding a white horse. He's going to usher in peace. We find out that the Antichrist is going to go in and in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to demand to be worshipped. And here's what's interesting. The Muslims teach that their people needs to worship the Al-Mahdi when he comes. They are to reverence him. They don't call it worship. They call it reverence him. They're to speak about him and they're to exalt him. Not only that, we're told in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist is going to kill those who refuse to worship the image. But what's interesting is when we go to the Al-Mahdi, their prophecies also say that he's going to kill those who refuse to worship Allah and reverence or exalt the Al-Mahdi. So the thing that I want you to see is the Islamic prophecies concerning the Al-Mahdi is exactly what John prophesied concerning the, the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. It's the very same thing. But the similarities between biblical eschatology and Islamic eschatology doesn't end with the Antichrist and the 12th Imam. If they did, then it might be easy to dismiss the similarities as mere coincidence. You know, we could look at this and we say, wow, what are the chances for this to happen? But it's really just a coincidence. But the similarities don't stop there. They also continue between the person the Bible refers to as the false prophet and the man known in Islam as Isa al masih which means Jesus, the Messiah. How many of you know that the Muslims believe in Jesus? Did you know that? The problem is they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. But they do believe in Jesus. It's just a different Jesus than what the Bible teaches. Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet and nothing more. They don't believe that Jesus was or is the Son of God. In fact, they believe that every time that Christians say that Jesus is divine, that Jesus was and Jesus is the Son of God, that it's blasphemy. And the reason they believe that it's blasphemy is because they're monotheists. But in that, they have a creed or a statement that they always make. And that statement is this. There is only one God and all is his name and Muhammad is his servant or his prophet. And for us to say that Jesus is the Son of God, they believe that's blasphemy. They also believe that Jesus did not die on the cross 
for the sins of mankind. The Quran specifically denies that Jesus was ever crucified, crucified or that he ever experienced death. Muslims believe that Allah miraculously delivered Jesus from death. And when he delivered him from death, he was caught up into heaven much like Elijah was. And now that he's with Allah, he's waiting to return to the earth in order to finish his ministry. Now, what is his ministry? Well, it's to aid the Al-Mahdi. In other words, he is not going to return until this Al-Mahdi, the Messiah, comes. First the Messiah comes, and then he shows up on the scene, and his job is to aid the Al-Mahdi in converting everyone in the world to Islam. Let me quote from the Islamic tradition. Jesus, the son of Mary, will descend and will lead them, judging amongst them according to the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, to make sure that everyone here understands the Muslim's perspective on who Jesus is, let me quote Sheikh Kabani, who's the chairman of the Islamic Supreme Council of America. Now, did you notice what I said? This guy is in America. He is the chairman of the Islamic Supreme Council of America. These are his words. Let me read them to you. Like all prophets, Prophet Jesus came with the divine message of surrender to God Almighty, which is Islam. When Jesus returns, he will personally correct the misrepresentations and misinterpretations about himself. He will affirm the true message that he brought in his time as a prophet. And that he never claimed to be the son of God. Furthermore, he will reaffirm in his second coming what he prophesied in his first coming. Bearing witness to the seal of the messenger, Prophet Muhammad. In his second coming, many non-Muslims will accept Jesus as a servant of Allah Almighty, as a Muslim and a member of the community of Muhammad. Now that gives you a pretty good idea of Muslims' perspective on Jesus. But I'm going to give you one more quote if you don't mind. It's written from a book by two Islamic scholars, Al-Sadir and Matahari. Jesus will descend from heaven and espouse the cause of the, Mahdi, the, of the Mahdi. Now, remember, his job is to promote the Al-Mahdi. He's subordinate to him, and he's going to be second in command. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should be in just a second. But anyways, Jesus will descend from heaven and espouse the cause of the Mahdi. The Christians and the Jews will see him and recognize his true status. The Christians will abandon their faith in his Godhead. In other words, they won't believe that he's divine. They're going to recognize that he was nothing more than a prophet. Now listen to me. If you haven't heard anything else, hear me on this because this is very important. Everything that Muslims believe that the prophet Jesus is going to do when he returns is exactly what John said the false prophet will do. So when the false prophet comes on the scene, Muslims are going to think that he is the prophet Jesus, the prophet they're waiting for. So when we begin to look at the prophecies concerning the Antichrist, and we compare them to the Islamic prophecies concerning the Al-Mahdi, they're amazingly similar. That is why the Muslims are going to accept the Antichrist. But the similarities don't stop there. The prophecies concerning the false prophet are so similar to the Islamic prophecies concerning the prophet Jesus. That not the Jesus of the Bible that we know, the Jesus that they think they know. And if you remember on the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said that many false Christs would come claiming to be Jesus. It's kind of interesting here. So, what is Islam expecting this prophet Jesus to do? Well, again, let me quote from the Islamic tradition. I don't just want to sit up here and tell you this because you might not believe me. So I am quoting. So let me quote from the Islamic tradition. The prophet said... There is no prophet between me and him that is Jesus. He will descend to the earth. He will break the cross, kill swine, and abolish jizya. Allah will perish all religions except Islam. Now, does everyone know what jizya is? Anyone ever heard the term? Jizya is kind of a poll tax. Let me explain what that is. 
If you live in a Muslim nation, which means that Islam is the state religion and it is an Islamic nation, you can live there as a non-Muslim if you pay the jizya. It's kind of like paying them for security. Now, you still have to obey their laws, and you still have to do it in such a way in which you respect and you reverence, and you do everything according to the Islamic thing, but you do not have to be a Muslim. That's what jizya is. And when you go to different Islamic nations, you'll see those that it's not all Christian. Or it's not all Christian, not all Muslim. You'll have some Christians there. You might have some other different religions there. But what's interesting is Muhammad set it up where you could have non-Muslims living in Muslims' land as long as they paid the jizya tax. Does that make sense? So, according to the Islamic faith, when Jesus returns, the Jesus they're looking for, he's going to do four things. He's going to break the crosses. He's going to kill all swine. He's going to abolish the jizya tax. And again, that's a Muslim tax on non-Muslims living in their nation or their land. And he's going to kill the Muslim Antichrist and his followers. Now let's talk about those four things. The first three things that are mentioned, breaking crosses, killing swine, abolishing the jizya tax, are based on the notion that Jesus is going to eliminate all other religions other than Islam. In fact, Islamic scholars interpret breaking the cross to mean that Jesus is going to abolish Christianity. Muslims believe that when Jesus comes, he's going to correct this false notion that he died on the cross for the sins of mankind. And that he's going to convert Christians into Muslims. He's going to convert them to the Islamic faith. Now, killing swine means that strict Muslim laws are going to be enforced upon the earth. And let me explain how they get that. You need to realize that swine is considered to be the most unclean animal that you can have. There's a whole list of unclean animals. But swine kind of depicts them because they're in the mud, they're all these things, but they are very unclean. One of the hardest things that I have to endure when I'm in Israel is eating breakfast over there. How many of you have ever traveled to Israel? Anyone here? This is the most amazing thing. I don't know if this shocked you. But when you get up for breakfast, they have all these salads there. They eat salad for breakfast. And they have yogurts, and for us Americans, they'll also have eggs there. Most of them are boiled eggs, and so you bring it out, or you have scrambled eggs. But there's no meat. There's no ham. There's no sausage. There's no bacon. There's two kibbutz that are secular. And when you travel, it's really nice if you can get to those two kibbutz because they actually grow swine. And they actually will serve bacon or pork ribs or those types. But the only two places. And it's kind of funny. Did you know that even McDonald's over there, they have kosher McDonald's? It's kind of interesting. And so we actually got to go to a McDonald's that was not kosher so you could get a cheeseburger. So you don't do dairy with meat. But anyways, you just have to understand this. But what's kind of interesting is that swine are unclean animals. But what swine represents is disobedience to the, to, the, uh, to the Islamic law. So when it says that he will kill all swine, what it means is that he is going to enforce strict Islamic law. Abolishing the jizya tax means that non-Muslims will no longer be allowed to live in Muslim nations. Everyone must become a Muslim or die. Let me read a passage from the Manual of Islamic Jurisprudence. The author is uh, Ahmed ibn Naqib Amistra, and I hope I said it right. And the book is The Reliance of the Traveler. It's a classic manual of Islamic jurisprudence. Let me quote from it. The time and the place for the jizya tax is before the final descent of Jesus. When Jesus comes, nothing but Islam will be accepted from them. For taking the jizya tax is only effective until Jesus descends upon the earth. In other words, we won't be able to do that. If you're a non-Muslim living in a Muslim nation, we will no longer accept that. You either convert to Islam or you're dead. Now they're saying that when Jesus comes, they're Jesus. That's what's going to happen. People, that's from their Islamic tradition, the Sunnah. Let me go further. Let me read from the book Doomsday Portents and Prophecies. 
Jesus, the son of Mary, will soon descend among the Muslims as a just judge. Jesus will therefore judge according to the law of Islam. All people will be required to embrace Islam. Now notice this. This is the last part. And there will be no other alternative. Let me say that again. All people will be required to embrace Islam. And there will be no other alternative. Now, that's the first three things that Jesus is going to do. Or I hate to even say that because that's not the real Jesus. There, Jesus is going to do. But what's the fourth thing? Well, the fourth thing is he's going to kill the Muslim Antichrist and his followers. You see, Muslims also believe that an Antichrist is going to come. But guess when they think the Antichrist is going to come? At the end of the seven-year peace treaty. Can you see where this is going, people? Can you make the connection? So when the real Jesus Christ returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to oppose him in battle. And because Muslims are going to believe that the Antichrist is the Al-Mahdi and the false prophet is the prophet Jesus, they're going to oppose the real Jesus Christ. Because they're going to think that the real Jesus Christ is the Antichrist. Because Satan has been putting this in their minds that at the end of the seven-year peace treaty, an Antichrist is going to come. And his name, and, and, and you know what's interesting is I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to tell you how it's spelled. It's D-A-J-J-A-L. And I know that usually with just one J, it'd be Dahal. But I don't know when two J's are put together. Like in Greek, if you have two gammas, it's not G, a G. It's actually an N-G, like ing. So I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm just going to say Dahal. That's the Antichrist. But people, that's how Satan's going to get all of these armies to go to war against Jesus Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verses 12 through 14. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to tell you what I thought the first time I ever read this. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to the kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. Who's the beast? The Antichrist. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. Together... All of these nations, these ten kings, these kingdoms, they've given their authority to him. So when the Antichrist says, come, they come. Together they will go to war against the Lamb. And who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. But the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. And his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. Now, you know, the very first time I ever read this, I thought, who would be stupid enough to go to war against Jesus? How many of you have ever thought that? You're reading through this and you're going, you know, God, I believe everything in your word. But when I get to this, surely people aren't so stupid that when Jesus Christ comes, that they're literally going to go to war with him. Who would do that? Because you see, at the time, I didn't understand anything about Islamic tradition. I didn't, I, I didn't understand the Islamic faith. It's only when I came across some writings and I began to realize, well, wait a minute, that's, that, that's closely similar. And I started doing more research and I started realizing, wait a minute. Satan has so set up this false religion, has so set up this Islamic faith, that he can then use them to literally oppose God and they'll think they're doing the right thing. And the thing that I want you to see tonight is that Satan has created a religion that will openly embrace him and his servants, the Antichrist and the false prophet. And not only will they embrace him, but they're going to fight with him. And that's how the world is going to be deceived into worshiping the dragon and accepting the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're going to think that the dragon is Allah. And let's be honest, I showed you several weeks ago that the dragon is Allah. In fact, it's kind of interesting. It's not this in Arabic, but it is in Hebrew. When you go to the book of Isaiah, what was Satan's sin? He wanted to be exalted above God. 
He wanted to ascend higher. And the word ascend there in the book of Isaiah is actually the Hebrew word Allah. And that is who Satan is to the Muslims. He is Allah. They don't recognize and realize. And so when we learn more and more about their culture and we think, man, these are a very barbaric people. Look at what they do and look at how they react. This isn't what we think it is. But you know what's interesting? The reason they're like that is because Allah is Satan. And the reason they're going to worship him is because to them, they think they're worshiping Allah. And they're going to think when the Antichrist comes that he's the Ahmadi. And when the false prophet comes on the scene, they're going to think that he's Jesus the prophet. And we're going to begin to see everything that's taking place that John prophesied begin to become fulfilled because the Muslims are going to believe that this is what is supposed to happen. And with the Christians gone because of the rapture, the whole world is going to be deceived with the exception of a few. Now I wanted you to understand this because as we begin to go through chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, there are times that we're going to go, how could that be? But the reason we say that is because we are so far removed from what's happening in the Muslim nations. We have never heard what they believe and how they believe. In fact, what's kind of interesting, they really don't want you to understand these things until they suck you in and they get you converted. And then you start hearing all of this, I'm going to call it what it is, trash. But the devil is going to use this to get the people to oppose God. Now, I had a person ask me, if Satan knows that he's going to lose, why is he going to do all of this? It's because Satan is full of hate. And he hates God. And he can't hurt God physically. The only way that he can really hurt God is to hurt who God loves. And God loves the world. And so Satan has has, has created this false religion where they'll worship him and, and they'll serve him. But more importantly, they're going to oppose God and it's going to take them to their destruction. And that's what Satan wants because the only way he can hurt God is to hurt the people that God loves. Now, I bring all this out not for you to come in and say, well, you Muslims. It's not that way at all. I just want you to be educated and knowledgeable that as we go through chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, and you're reading this and you're thinking, how in the world could this be? You need to realize it could happen immediately as soon as the rapture takes place. You take the Christians out of here, it could happen just like that. You know, we were in Israel again, and we went to the uh, Temple Institute. And I'm telling you, they are ready to build the third temple. And we were up on the Temple Mount. And last time, we didn't get to spend as much time as I wanted on the Temple Mount. But this time, we did. And so I walked down to the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate. That's where it says that the Messiah is going to come in. That's where Jesus is going to come in. So guess what the Muslims did? The Muslims went in, and they walled that up. Like, that's going to keep Jesus from going in. This kind of blows my mind. They've got it all walled up. But, you know, I talked about the Dome of the Rock and where it's located and that I didn't believe that the temple was going to be built where the Dome of the Rock is. I believe that the Dome of the Rock is still going to be there and so will the temple. And if you go back and you read Solomon's temple, go look at the dimensions. But the most interesting thing is I walked to the Eastern Gate because most scholars are beginning to believe that Solomon's temple was actually lined up with the Eastern Gate. And with the Eastern Gate, even though that wall has been torn down and now it's been built upon it by the Ottoman Empire, they also are starting to believe that the Eastern Gate right now, the Golden Gate, was built exactly where the old Eastern Gate was. In fact, they weren't supposed to be uh, digging there, but they actually had a person who went there at night and he was digging because he wanted to get to the foundation, doing his own thing, and he fell into this cavernous opening. And guess what they found? Took pictures of it and everything. The foundation for the Eastern Gate. So I walked down to the Eastern Gate and I did a 90 degree perpendicular line and over there is the Dome of the Rock. And right there was perfect, enough room to build the third temple. I'm here to tell you it's there. Every Jew that you meet, every Zionist that you meet, 
They're telling you about the prophecies in Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones. And they're talking about what God is doing. And you know, I, I see all of these things taking place and I realize it's going to happen in our lifetime, people. It might not happen for another 20, 30 years. You study numerology. It might not be until 2030, 2034, somewhere in there. But it's going to happen in our lifetime. And I'm telling you, the way that it's going, we're going to see it happen. But it could happen at any moment. You take the, the Christians out of the picture, and I can guarantee you, the Muslims are ready to fill that gap. And for all the things that Satan has picked up and put together and set in place, it's ready to roll exactly the way that John prophesied it in the book of Revelation. Let's stand.